Lauren Lounden from Keene State College. And this is a short video lecture on fundamental metrics that one can look at to determine the quality of a genome assembly. Just a couple of the simpler, easy to look at metrics. So we're still asking the question, what is good when you look at your genome assembly? How do you know if it's good or good enough? So this assumes that you've already verified that your data is in fact your data, um, and it's not a mistake from the sequencing lab or like a contaminant that you sequence by accident in your own lab. And now you want to move on and look at the baseline quality of the assembly. And first you might ask like, well, why? Like, why should I care about any of this? And here it's good to remember the, um, the saying garbage in, garbage out, because if the data that goes into an analysis is not high quality or high quality enough, then the results of the analysis will be of similar quality. And so you don't want to spend a lot of time doing something, running an analysis pipeline and perhaps writing a paper um, if the data is not good quality. And you certainly don't want to publish data that's not good quality. An example of where this has gone wrong is uh, some of the work that's been done on tardigrad, which are nicknamed baby water bears. And here's one shown here. These are small um, animal organisms, and they are of great interest because they are incredibly resistant to um, radiation and also to desiccation or drying stress. They're really, really tough organisms, and there are all kinds of interesting stories about these, not least of which is they were shot off into space by an Israeli um, not manned rocket. Uh, I think it was in 2019 and um, to the moon to see if we could make a biodeposit on the moon for future people to recover, I suppose. Um, and in any way, any case, the uh, rocket ship exploded and um, so the tardigrads were shot out into space all around and over the surface of the moon and uh, nobody will ever probably be able to recover them at this point, but um, they were part of kind of an interesting, if ill-conceived experiment not that long ago in space exploration and biosurvival. But a few years ago, um, this group shown here, Boothby et al, sequenced the genome of tardigrad uh, organisms and published this paper titled Evidence for Extensive horizontal gene transfer from the draft genome of a tardigrad. The abstract of that paper, a portion of it is pasted here, and I've highlighted the notable number here. It says approximately one-sixth of the genes in the tardigrad genome were found to have been acquired through horizontal gene transfer. Um, and that that is a lot of genes. And um, so they were suggesting, these authors were suggesting, based on the analysis of the draft genome that they obtained, they were suggesting that as much as one-sixth of the tardigrad genome came in not from vertical inheritance, um, from ancestors of the tardigrad, but instead from, primarily from prokaryotes in the environment. And that was really interesting. It generated a lot of um, second looking at this paper. And as a result of that, a number of people took the draft genome that this group published. And it turns out there were problems with that too, and that they published the wrong draft genome and had to do some corrections. But in any case, subsequent anal analysis by other groups showed that the assembly contained a lot of contaminant DNA, and it contained a lot of um, sequencing artifact DNA. And when you remove that DNA from the assembly, or from the data prior to assembly and redo the assembly. In fact, it looks like only as much as 7% of the tardigrad genes are from horizontal gene transfer from neighboring prokaryotes. That's still a lot of horizontal gene transfer, but it's a lot less than one sixth. Um, and I think this paper, this story is a really good illustration of where you need to really double check your data um, and the quality of the assembly in this case led to some hasty statements that were not justified by the data at all and that did not hold up under scientific scrutiny. This is from the subsequent analysis and I'll point out a couple things. They looked at GC content um, and they looked at the unfiltered data and the filtered data and that's the difference between untrusted and trusted. And the trusted data shows a uniform GC content 
and that is because most of it is from the actual tardigrade genome. The percent GC is organism specific, something Erwin Shargoff discovered back in <coughs> the early 1950s. Um, they also looked at gene spacing, per site variability, and per site coverage, and all of these metrics really changed in the uh, genome when it was appropriately, when the data was appropriately pre filtered to remove artifacts. That's an example of why you should care about the quality of your assembly. So how do you know if your assembly is good? What are some of the things that you can look at? So one of the things you can do is you can view the assembly graph, and we'll look at some examples of that in a moment. You can also look at assembly metrics, and three common um, ones that are considered are listed here. You can look at the number of contigs. Spades, confusingly enough, calls the contigs nodes, which is horribly confusing when also mixing in what you know about De Bruyne graph theory at this point. So, but the more contigs there are, generally the poorer the assembly went. The ultimate goal being to have one contig per actual chromosome or DNA real world structure. You can also look at a parameter called the N50 and I'll define that for you in a moment. And you can look at coverage, and I'll define that for you in a moment. There are many other assembly metrics, but these are three very common and important ones to consider. So when viewing assembly graphs, recently, um, well, I guess it was 2015, so five years ago now, Ryan Wick wrote a really cool program called Bandage. Um, and Bandage allows us to view um, De Bruyne-generated assembly such as the ones produced from the program SPADE. It allows us to visualize them in a very useful way um, and get a visual metric on the quality of the assembly. We learned about this at Keene State College um, by finding this article that was published in the New York Times, and this is back when the Zika virus was a major problem. Um, and the Zika virus is spread by mosquito bites, in particular mosquitoes of the group Aedes aegypti. At that time, uh, scientists were trying to figure out how better to control Aedes aegypti, and those efforts were hampered by the lack of genome data on Aedes aegypti. And so there was a call for help that was put out by the scientists involved, and a group of researchers came together and made a major, major effort to um, sequence the genome of Aedes aegypti more completely so that that baseline information could be used to help develop control programs. For example, genome modification, which we won't get into here. So um, as part of that effort, the program Bandage was used to visualize the assembly. And it's shown here in this New York Times article. Each of the lines is a contig. It's a big, complicated genome. Ours will be simpler, since we'll focus on prokaryotes. So to use Bandage, you need the assembly graph. And if you look at, I realize this is a little bit small, but if you look in here, this is a screenshot from an area in my Ron account, my, the teaching part of my Ron account, and you'll notice this assembly underscore graph dot fast g. It's a dot fast g file. There are actually two assembly graphs produced by spades that are in kind of the main output for assembly. One is the, just called assembly underscore graph. And one is called assembly underscore graph underscore with underscore scaffolds dot GFA. For our purposes, we will focus simply on assembly underscore graph dot fast G. You can pull those graphs or that graph off Ron and drop it onto your desktop for use in bandage. You'll also note in your spades output that there are a number of folders of varying K composition. So like K127, K21 are shown here. If you go inside those folders, that's the spades output put wherein the assembly was done entirely with KMERS of the size indicated by the folder name. So for example, K127 is the spades output where it ran the entire spades algorithm with KMER sizes of strictly 127 in nature. In each of these folders, there's another assembly graph. You can look at them if you're interested, and you can ask uh, different questions using that information. The assembly information that's put out in this kind of main area outside of those folders is what Spades has deemed to be 
um, the most, um, the most, you know, the best quality assembly. And so we'll, we'll just go with that. So bandage, you can access bandage in a couple of different ways. You can go get it and you can put it on your own computer. And the directions for doing that are at Ryan uh, Wick's GitHub page. There's an introductory area linked to the download area there. You need to pay attention if you're a Mac user that you use the right specifics on that or it won't work for you. Or you can simply access Bandage on this really awesome, awesome online platform called Galaxy, which is designed for community sourcing genomics work. You can do a lot of the stuff that we're doing in class on Galaxy, and we're going to be checking out that platform in a variety of ways in this class because you won't always have access to a resource like Ron. Bandage is loaded there. Um, and you can add your assembly graph, upload it to Galaxy. You can look at the graph views, and you can look at some summary statistics on metrics for assembly quality there. What you get when you load an assembly graph into the Bandage program is you get a visual of the graph. So this is like circular looking, so it's tempting to think that's the whole chromosome, but it's actually just a map of the assembly itself, which is related but not identical. Each of the little colored lines, like this purple one here, is a contig. They're joined together by edges, so I can't zoom in easily on my computer, but if we were to zoom in, there are edges there. There are areas of ambiguity, like through here, the, the, the connectivity isn't one-to-one, -one, so there are multi-degreed nodes in here. You can play with the defaults in Bandage, at least when you have it on your own computer, and you can actually also use Bandage to look at the coverage. So you can see read depth for each contig, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then you can see down here there are areas or contigs that, that did not assemble with this other content. This could be a plasmid or another artifact, or perhaps it could be contaminant DNA or DNA from a different source. And Spades has been able to figure out that this DNA does not go with this DNA, and so it's parsing it out separately. Bandage is helpful um, for a lot of different reasons. So let's say you sequence an organism and unknownst to you, it has this genetic structure. It's a prokaryotic organism. It's got a circular chromosome. Here and here are these areas of repetitive DNA, okay? So you get your genome, you sequence it, you've got your reads, you assemble it. You get like a simple situation where you have these three contigs. This brown one at the bottom is only going to be one contig because if these data are identical, then um, they're all going to pile up together in the assembly. So Bandage would show you a graph like this. Right? So it's going to take this contig and see that it connects here, and it's going to take this contig and see that it connects here. So it'll give you a graphical of that, and looking at that, you could know that this could mean a couple of different possibilities mean a structure like this or it could mean a structure like that. So Bandage won't solve that question for you but it'll organize the data into a graphical image that lets you know that it's this or this that you're looking at and you can do subsequent experimentation to solve that problem like there's a set of very clever PCR experiments you could do to figure that out. Output from Bandage can also be used to optimize the parameters that you've set for an assembly. So for example, we just ran spades and let spades pick the kamer that it uses or kamers that it uses. Um, but you can, you can be more specific in spades or in other programs about which kamers you want used. And then you can compare the assembly result. Anytime you see a knotted up ball, the assembly hasn't gone as well as when you see more space or gaps and longer contigs with less uh, areas where things are knotted up, which means that the assembly is you know, not as clear. So this is poorer than this on the right. So that's a little bit about assembly graphs and looking at them. Other parameters that are interesting, and Bandage will actually compute this for you in the summary statistics, but there are other programs that will give you this information, and we'll look at some of them in class. There's a parameter called the N50 that is commonly reported for all genome analyses that are done. 
the definition of an N50 is it is it is the point at which 50% of the genome is in contigs as large as the N50 value or more. So if you took all the contigs, so you've got this genome, it's like a thousand base pairs long, this is just an example, and you take all the contigs that you got and you stack them up. So here we've got the littlest contig on the far right and the biggest contig on the far left. The N50 is this center point here because the rest of the genome is contained in contigs as big as that 30 uh, base pair contig or larger. And so the N50 at this point is this 30 value. It's easier to view this graphically. In short, what you want are N50s that are as large as possible because it's an indirect measure of just having a lot of large or a few large contigs, which gives you better resolution of the genomic information there. Coverage is another parameter that is important. So coverage can refer to the whole genome, a specific sequence or region of the genome, or one specific base. So for example, one specific base is shown here in, in red, and the coverage here is one, two, three, four, five, six. It's six-fold coverage at this position. We could also cover, calculate average coverage for all of this, or average coverage over an entire genome. And there are a variety of ways to calculate that. When spades outputs a contig, it gives you the average contig uh, coverage, read coverage, uh, within the file header. And you can, you can see that pretty easily if you look for it. In general, more coverage is better, but it also costs more money to get greater depth of sequencing or depth of coverage. And so um, your, your goal as a researcher is to get enough coverage but not pay for more than you need. So that concludes our presentation, this presentation on a few of the basic metrics of genome assembly and why you should care about it with an example. Um, next we will move on to some other topics that are wherein you can look at the quality of your assembly in a way that's very specific to your project.